Um, my name is Bob Adler. I'm the interim dean um, at the College of Law, and I would like to welcome you to the 30th annual Jefferson Fordham um, debate. We're also live streaming uh, the event, so I'd also like to um, welcome all of you out in TV land there. <laughs> um, I want to begin by thanking the co-organizers of the event, my colleagues, Professor Wayne McCormick um, and Professor Amos Giura. Um, Professor Giura is also the co-director of our Center for Global Justice, um, which helped to organize this event, um, and he will be giving some brief closing remarks. Um, Professor McCormick and Professor Giura, um, I hope you'll agree, conceived of a fascinating topic um, for this evening, um, a critically important topic. Um, they recruited two excellent speakers um, and an excellent moderator, Kirk Jowers, um, from the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Uh, Mr. Jowers will have the pleasure of introducing our speakers in a couple of minutes. I also want to thank um, our event staff, Miriam Lovin, Kayla Bernard, um, Mark Beekhuizen, and his staff for their technical support. It's a particular pleasure to celebrate the 30th edition of what has become one of the greatest traditions at the College of Law, um, and one that honors one of our most esteemed former colleagues, um, Jefferson Fordham. I kind of like this picture because, note the resemblance, the mustache? <laughs> it's, it, that's undoubtedly where the resemblance ends. Um, <laughs> professor Fordham was a professor at Louisiana State and Vanderbilt Law, Law Schools. He was then dean at Ohio State and dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School for a total of 23 years. Um, I've been serving as interim deans for um, three and a half months. I can't quite imagine um, 23 years um, of deanship. Um, but to our, or Utah's, great fortune, after he became an emeritus um, faculty member at Pennsylvania, he joined our faculty in 1970 and taught for another 23 years until he was 87 um, years old before his death at the age of 88 in late June of 1994. A fact I focus on because it's to my great disfortune um, that I never got to meet Jefferson Fordham. It, turned, it turns out that he passed away just days before I arrived in Salt Lake City to teach um, in early July of 1994. Um, Fordham was among the great legal scholars of the 20th um, century and one of the great um, legal educators. Chief Justice Earl Warren called him one of the more courageous, forward-looking, um, and effective forces for justice in our day. Then Chief Judge Charles Cook said that he was composed of a core of Vermont granite enclosed in a covering of Southern charm. And among his many accomplishments, he was a champion of individual rights and racial equality. In the late 1950s, when it was hardly popular to do so, he was an advocate um, of anti-discrimination laws in states, including the South. He led a group of lawyers in urging um, Governor George Wallace to obey anti-desegregation um, uh, laws. He was an advisor to President Kennedy on ethics in government and conflicts of interest in government. He was instrumental in establishing the American Bar Association's first division on civil rights, again, when the ABA was hardly a progressive organization and was reluctant to do so. And he was one of the principal advocates for the nation's first fair housing law in 1967. We're also indebted to um, Jefferson Fordham's family and friends, especially to his widow, Rita Fordham, um, for providing the generous donations to support this annual event, which allows us to engage on the critical issues of our time. If you look at the list of debate topics over the past 29 years, you'll see that we have covered um, the world um, in the types of issues that we have engaged in the debate. Unfortunately, Rita Fordham cannot be here tonight. Um, she's been here for many years. She's now 98 um, years old, so I thought I'd bring you to, he, uh, to her photographically. Uh, Jim Holbrook and I, uh, visited her a few weeks ago. Um, there she is in the center, propping Jim and I up. Um, <laughs> remarkably spry. Um, she was delighted by um, the topic of the debate, 
um, this evening, and we hope she'll be able to watch um, the, um, the video. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Kirk Jowers as our um, moderator. Kirk is the director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics and Federal um, Relations, himself as a leading expert in many of the issues that we're going to talk about um, this evening. He's a proud and distinguished alumnus, alumnus of the, of the uh, University of Utah um, and of Harvard Law School. Um, significant experience on these issues in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, and he's been called the most quoted person in Utah. So thank you very much for <laughs> serving as our moderator this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and I've got to tell you, uh, Dean Adler is doing an amazing job as dean of this law school. Um, I, I'm able to witness it in a few different capacities, and he is really taking this law school to great places, making changes and improvements that will last forever. So I appreciate this invitation and uh, really enjoy working with you and the, the law school. Um, also an honor, two of my, my favorite people in the world, Amos and, and Wayne, absolutely brilliant and uh, so grateful to to be associated with you in any way, including this. And then today, we have, uh, we, we have a great format, I think. I think these Fordham debates are a wonderful way of, of really helping you to engage on an issue. And we couldn't have picked, uh, and I get no credit for picking them, so that goes to the people I just mentioned. But I am honored to sit between two amazing people. If you've read any of their work, um, you'll know we have got, we are well represented and we will be enlightened uh, and challenged tonight. Uh, on my right is Nora Bensahel, who is the Deputy Director of Studies and a Senior Fellow in the Center for a New American Security, who recently co-authored The Seven Deadly Sins of Defense Spending, Hard Choices, Responsible Defense in an Age of Austerity, and Sustainable Preeminence, Reforming the U.S. Military at a Time of Strategic Change. Her other research interests include stability operations, counterinsurgency, counter civilian capacity for operations abroad, and coalition and alliance operations. Nora is also an adjunct associate professor in the Security Studies program at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, where she teaches MA classes and received the Alumni Leadership Council Teaching Award. Let's give a big hand for our guest. <laughs> Tom Ferrer has had an amazingly distinguished career. Uh, he's the a university professor of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver and is the former dean of that school from 1996 to 2010. He's also the former president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights of the Organization of American States, uh, OAS, and served as president of the University of New Mexico. Within the United States government, he has served as Special Assistant, first to the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, and then to the Assistant Secretary of State for Inter-American Affairs. He has taught law at Columbia University, American University, Rutgers, Tulane, and Harvard, and international relations at Cambridge University, Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School, and the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International St uh, Studies. A big hand. <laughs> Thank you. So our format is, is pretty simple. Um, I, we, will, we will first go to Tom, who is the proponent of our uh, a theme today. Uh, we'll then go to Noor, we'll give her opening statement, uh, and then we'll begin the discussion. I'll have a couple of questions, and then we'll look forward to your questions and comments as we move forward. We'll, we'll pause at this point and turn the podium over to Tom Fair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Can everyone hear? I know you've moved back to uh, <laughs> escape us, I, I think. Uh, if you'll indulge me just for a second, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to thank Wayne and Amos for organizing this meeting, for, particularly for inviting me, uh, bringing me back to a great, a great public university and to wonder, one of the most 
underappreciated cities, I think, in the, in the United States. And also for forcing me, and I'm sure it had the same effect on my colleague Nora, to rethink my ideas. You know, you, you develop a set of ideas about whatever your subject happens to be, in my case, foreign policy, and you stop thinking about your ideas at that, at that moment. And they kind of lock into place, and it takes an event like this to force you to rethink those ideas. Now, you often come to the same conclusions. It may suggest that it was a kind of formal rethink that remains to be seen, but I have a sense that I had to exert myself intellectually, and that's a good feeling. So thanks on, on all of those counts. The, the topic is, is not entirely free of ambiguity, uh, but I have to believe that the organizers of, of this meeting saw it as an opportunity to reinvigorate the great debate over the the, the long-running direction of U.S. foreign policy, a debate which really flowered after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And the United States found itself alone in a world where it had been in this highly conflictual dyadic relationship. And so it was really compelled to rethink what it was trying to achieve in, in the world. So it was a, a, rich, a rich debate, and then it was a little bit overtaken by 9-11. And now I think there is a chance to renew that debate. Now I know that people who have spent their life in the national security bureaucracy uh, often feel that discussion of grand strategy, of the <coughs> grand trajectory of foreign policy is the playpen of academics that, as some of them put it, after all, foreign policy is transactional. You wake up each day, there's a problem. The Saudis want to buy your newest stealth fighter. The Israeli lobby has already activated 5,000 people to call friends on the hill to say why you shouldn't sell, and you need to prepare a statement for the president, and that that's how foreign policy gets made. It's transactional. Well. From my experience in government, which wasn't all that, all that long, and from observing government, I don't think that's really the case. Because these quotidian reactions to events are always framed. They're framed by a view of the world, a view of what the United States is trying to achieve, framed above all by a sense of who are our friends and who are our, our enemies. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? And that is bound to influence, and I've seen it influence day-to-day decision-making. Uh, I just think of one, one example. Not all of you were born at the time, but some of you obviously were. No insult intended. Uh, <laughs> the time of the Central American Wars of the, of the 1980s, and I remember some years later, interviewing my long-term acquaintance, Bob Pastor, who was in the National Security Council in the late years of the Carter administration, and asking him, because the Carter administration did everything in its power to prevent the Sandinistas from coming to power in Nicaragua, and were prepared even to maintain the structure, the basic structure of the dictatorship of, of Somoza. And I said, well, did you ever talk to Sandinista leaders during the struggle to see what their goals were, whether there could be a modus vivendi between them and the United States. And he said, well, of course not. I'd be fired immediately if I did, because all leftist movements were regarded as the enemy. And that, of course, that influenced day-to-day -day activities, day-to-day -day -day decision making. So framing is critical, and different frames lead to different foreign policies. I, I rise to defend what I'll call, for want of a better description, a liberal grand strategy. And I, I see its main opponent, not the only one, but its main opponent, 
the grand strategy that was enunciated in this first flowering of discussion that occurred after the Cold War among neoconservative publicists. And their position was put, I think, most succinctly, most effectively by a man with a prune-faced heart but a first-class intellect named Charles Krauthammer, who wrote, a, who wrote an article called The Unipolar Moment. And I'm, for purposes of this, of this debate, this discussion, I'm really equating the, the effort to, to sustain uh, sole superpower status as really an effort to be the unipower. So I'm going to say unipower instead of sole superpower. Uh, that's just a question of, of choice, but I think it sharpens, it sharpens the issue. So what are the negative consequences of, of seeking to be the unipower, which is really what I'm, I'm here to, to state? Uh, First, I would say the effort to be a unipower will inevitably reinforce the most dysfunctional tendencies in American foreign policy. The first of those tendencies is an instinct to intervene in order to shape the trajectory of the political and social lives of other countries. And, I, it, and it's not... Even if you don't object to that on moral grounds, and there are good reasons for not objecting to it on moral grounds, I think it's a mistake in terms of the national interest of the United States, or it has been frequently the led, to, led to blowback which has been injurious to the long-term interests of the country. And let me just give one example, and I only have time to give one example, as the chair will point out in a moment. Uh, <laughs> At the moment, one of the critical issues on the American foreign policy agenda is supposed to be Iran. How did we enter this dialectic of intense hostility? Where did it begin? Because everything begins someplace. I would propose to you that it began in 1953 when we colluded in the overthrow of the only fully democratic, democratically elected government in the history of that country. That is the overthrow of the prime minister of the time, Mohammed Mossadegh, which led to the restoration of the regime of the Shah of Iran, which led to U.S. collaboration for many years with the Shah and with his secret police, the Savak, who tortured and murdered many of his opponents, both on the left and the right, both the mullahs and radical students and liberal students, for that matter. Ultimately, the overthrow of the Shah in 1979, the seizure of the US embassy, and the hostage crisis, and I, I felt at the time that probably the driving force behind the seizure of the embassy and the resulting hostage crisis was the belief that we would again try to restore the Shah to, to power. Then, the invasion of Iran by Iraq, as, by Saddam Hussein, as clear an act of aggression as the invasion of Kuwait in 1991, our support of the aggressor, even when the aggressor used poison gas, not only against his own people, but against the Iranian armed forces. In fact, recent documentation shows that we helped to target the Iranian armed forces against which he used his gas laden artillery. A series of events have led to a dialectic of intense hostility, which is where we are today. So I just offer that as one instance where the instinct I could offer others, and the chairman may push me to offer others, Nora may push me to offer others, but I offer it as one instance of, of blowback, which I think was inconsistent with the interests of the country, quite, a, quite irrespective of any moral, moral issue. All right, the second instinct the second, let's say, dysfunctional tendency, which I believe arises from the effort to sustain or to attain unipower status, is what I call Manichaeanism. The view that the world is divided into good, 
and evil, good governments and evil governments. We don't have conflicts of interest. We have conflicts of good and bad governments and people. Now, this has three consequences. One, when you see people who frustrate you or a regime that frustrates you as evil, it certainly inhibits your capacity for measured judgment about the claims that it's making. And secondly, it makes compromise exceedingly difficult because you don't compromise about moral issues and with, the Im with immoral people, not easily. It makes collaboration very difficult. Now, we did manage a moment of collaboration, or it's not well known, but there was a moment of collaboration with the Iranians because our interests actually coincided in Afghanistan. They hated the Taliban and they feared them more than we did. And initially in Iraq, when we overthrew Saddam Hussein, which also was in their interest, probably more in their interest even than in our, our interest. And finally, I think that Manichaeanism leads to myopia. It leads to obsessions. Uh, and the obsession that I'm particularly thinking of was the obsession with the Soviet Union. Of course, there was a Soviet threat, but it wasn't looking long term, looking broadly, the only long term threat to American interests. And so when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan and we decided to make them bleed by working with the Saudis to organize a jihad against the Soviet Union and thousands of young of young Muslims from all over the world came to fight against the Soviet Union. Well, we did make them bleed, but there were consequences for us, which we're feeling to this, to this day. Anyway, the, the second problem, the second dysfunction, I would say, in seeking unipower power status is that it inevitably has an erosive effect on civil liberties within the country. It's like a permanent, it leads to a permanent war environment. It enhances the power of the executive. It inhibits the courts from reviewing the executive. It reduces the monitoring power of the Congress. It, the Congress self inhibits in that kind of, in that kind of an emotional environment. I myself believe that increased surveillance is inevitable. And, I'm not, and some of it I don't oppose myself. But I think it's fair to say that overall, the effort to achieve unipower power status will lead to a progressive erosion of civil liberties in the country. And the third problem is that, and maybe this is the most important, that the pursuit of unipower power status is at war with the institutionalization of great power collaboration. And I think at this moment in history, two things can be said. One that, and this is a very extravagant statement, I, I make it with some hesitation because I'm sure people can, will have a chance to poke some holes in what I'm saying, but let me try it out on you. It's, a, it's an hypothesis. that for the first time in history, as soon as someone says that, your hackle should go up. For the first time in history, the, the main interests, the most important interests of all the great powers coincide. All right? I offer that to you as an hypothesis. At the same time, and one of the reasons they coincide is that we, all of the great powers, are faced with a series of threats to our security that are peculiar to this historical moment mass migration, state collapse, intense strain on water resources, transnational terrorism, the spread of the capacity to develop weapons of mass destruction, the fragility of the global economic system. This whole set of problems is new to the world. And every one of the great powers faces this. Well, we have, con it doesn't say that we don't have any conflicts of interest. We do. I'm just saying that those conflicts of interest are not as strong, not as important as this overlap of interests. And therefore, and the only way to address these problems is through 
an unprecedented degree of institutionalized, that's, an, that's the key word, institutionalized collaboration. I don't have time to draw out the policy implications of that, but I hope either the chair or one of you will ask me to, hint. <laughs> uh, but I will just say that one of the characteristics of a unipower or of the pursuit of unipower is to emphasize your exceptionalism. And what that means is that while you want an orderly world and a commercial republic like ourselves necessarily wants an orderly world, but we want an orderly world in which we are not inhibited by that order, in which we make the judgments as to when we will conform to the order and when we won't. And that, that view, that sense of exceptionalism is incompatible with the construction of new institutions of great power collaboration. Thank you very much. Let me start also by thanking you for having me here for uh, what I think is an, an incredibly important topic to be discussing. And I, I want to start out there because international security, defense issues, and the ro more broadly, the role of the United States in the world is not something that gets a lot of attention today in our current political debates. And yet it's something that I think is absolutely vital. Uh, the United States is, is a global power. This is something I'm going to hark back to throughout my comments. Uh, and I don't think that these issues are getting the debate, the airtime, the critical thought that they need. So I, I applaud you for your choice of topics to be, enable us to explore that today. Um, I find myself agreeing with a fair amount of what Tom said, but my job here is to argue the opposite, opposite point of the resolution, and I'm going to do so by offering a different definition of what I see a superpower is, as he had. I think that's really where the, the differences in our two views will, will come down. Um, and in fact, the very first thing I had in my notes before I heard him talk uh, that I had prepared <laughs> Is, is to define the term superpower, because this is one of those terms that can mean a whole lot of things in a whole lot of different contexts. You bring a lot of baggage to that word. It immediately sort of brings up a Cold War mentality. Those who have read Krauthammer think about the unipolar moment, because that was a very, very seminal article in, in 1990 that was written. And it also, I think, has taken on a particular view that I actually think Tom expressed very well after the first George W. Bush administration going in, with the wars in Afghanistan and going into Iraq that I think he laid out uh, very well some of the principles that underlay that and, and really some of the very negative consequences in terms of seeing the world as good and evil, um, in terms of the effects on civil liberties. I don't want to say that that is just something that has happened uh, in the George W. Bush administration, but I think that since that's the most recent one, people tend to associate that type of foreign policy with what it means to be a superpower. And so I'm going to offer what I think is a very different definition of what that means and then argue why I think the United States absolutely must remain a superpower in my definition of that term. So I'm going to start unusually in defining a term by saying what it doesn't mean to be a superpower. Okay? It does not mean that the United States needs to be able to completely dominate the international system. It does not mean that the United States needs to dictate outcomes to others. And it does not mean that the United States needs to prefer unilateral action above all else. And I think all of those things tend to get wrapped up very often in the conception of what a superpower it is. It does not necessarily mean that the United States should be the global policeman going and intervening everywhere in, in places where there are crises or conflicts. And it also doesn't mean that military strength is necessarily far more important than other elements of national power, including economic power, political power, and diplomatic strength. So if I've sort of said that superpower, being a superpower doesn't involve all of those things, what does it mean? And I think there's a very short, simple way to, to define it. I define it as the ability to project power and influence anywhere in the world and to be able to do so potentially in more than one region of the world at a time. Why do I think that's so important? Why have I sort of centered my definition on that? It goes back to the fact, and Tom raised this in his points, that the United States benefits greatly from the current global order and has very strong interest in protecting that global order. 
from that, I would identify three core national interests and objectives. And I've lumped, I've, for the sake of simplicity and time, I've lumped these into three broad categories. We can explore more, you know, if you're interested in, in questions. But at its very core, I think there are three things that are absolutely in the U.S. national interest that it must do in the international sphere. The first is that it must deter and, if necessary, defend against direct external threats. This is, of course, the key security imperative for all states. But it means a couple of specific things in the U.S. context. First, it means maintaining the U.S. strategic nuclear deterrent. It also means maintaining enough conventional military power to deter states from challenging the United States because we want potential adversaries to think that if they do challenge those fundamental interests and threaten the United States directly, that to know that they would face extraordinarily high consequences for doing so. And even more than ever before, it requires addressing a range of emerging non-state, non-traditional threats that often involve non-state actors, such as preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, managing terrorist threats, and something that I really don't think gets enough attention that we should be, all be a lot more concerned about that we are, the potential for cyber attacks on U.S. critical infrastructure. These tasks absolutely require a strong military that can project global power. That doesn't mean that the military tool is the only way to address these things. And in fact, particularly on some of the uh, non-traditional threats, um, there are also good ways to address it through, um, through economic initiatives, sorry, diplomatic initiatives, na san economic sanctions, and other elements of national power. But military power and the ability to project power around the world is a critical component of that fundamental task. The second uh, key interest, national security interest, that the United States has is to protect its allies from direct attacks. The United States has signed formal mutual defense treaties with many countries to come to their aid if needed. The clearest and most obvious example is the NATO alliance. Article 5 of the NATO treaty explicitly states that, and this is a direct quote, an armed attack against one or more one or more member states in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against them all. And in fact, Article 5 has been invoked. It was invoked once in its history, and that was on September 12, 2001, in response to the U.S. Uh, to the terrorist attacks on 9/11. Um, which really, if uh, you were a person who grew up in the Cold War and watched, uh, you know, NATO and Article 5 was really supposed to be about the United States coming to aid Europe if Europe uh, faced some sort of threat during the Cold War. It was truly remarkable to see it be invoked for the first time uh, by European allies to help defend the United States, and there were NATO operations that most people aren't aware of that actually did things like flying combat air patrols over U.S. territory uh, during the days and weeks following 9-11. NATO is the clearest example, but there are plenty others as well, as well, including Australia, Japan, Korea, and a lot of others around the world. And again, in order to maintain the, the commitments that we've made to our U.S. allies around the world, you need a strong military to be a part of that, too. These two things are pretty well understood. They're not terribly controversial. Um, but there's a third one, and I would really highlight this, because again, I think that this is the, the most underappreciated key national security interest of the United States. And that's to promote an open and rules-based international global order, uh, which includes protecting the global commons. I emphasize this so much as a key U.S. security interest because it directly benefits the United States. This order continues to benefit the United States today, and the reasons why are pretty clear. The United States pretty much set up this order at the end of World War II. But even more importantly, and I think this is, again, is not always as appreciated as it should be, this global order does not only benefit the United States. It directly benefits many other states in the international system as well. For decades, the United States has served as a linchpin of an interconnected system of alliances and coalitions that includes over 60 countries. Contrast that with Russia and China, for example, which, depending on exactly how you count, can count no more than a handful of allies around the world who are willing to commit themselves to work with those countries. Together, these 60 countries account for more than 80% of the global gross domestic product. And this unprecedented network of cooperation across many different issue areas has steadily provided the greatest levels of prosperity, security, and freedom in world history, including for nations outside that network. It's not just the 60 that I've mentioned. There are ripple effects that go much more broadly throughout the international community. There are many different aspects of that global order. And in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on what I think is the single most important one, and that's the freedom of the seas.
It is extraordinarily important to the United States. We have a direct economic interest in this order because trade accounts for almost 20 percent of all U.S. economic activity. So we have a very strong interest in ensuring that merchant ships can continue to sail the seas uh, wherever, they, wherever they need to go. But it's even more important to the global economy than it is to the United States in particular because over 90 percent of the world's commerce and over two-thirds of its petroleum travel by sea. According to one estimate, the value of global merchant shipping was approximately $430 billion. The problem with this shipping, though, is that there are a lot of choke points in the world. There are a lot of narrow straits and places where countries that, if they wish to do so, uh, can try to close down access or to try to make access through those areas part of national control, either for financial reasons or because they are trying to harm the economic or security interests of other countries. There is no other country, simply put, in the, in the world right now that possesses the military capability to deter or prevent other states from challenging the freedom of the seas, and those challenges are actually increasing, a point I'll return to in a minute. So the United States directly benefits economically from ensuring the freedom of the seas, but so do many other countries as well. Why do I put so much emphasis on an open and rules-based international order? I think the reason is clearest to see if you talk about what the alternative to that would be. So an alternative to this current global order that we have would be a system based on exclusive blocks. It would be based on spheres of influence, and it would be based on mercantilist networks, which would reduce the freedom, prosperity, uh, and peace that I mentioned before. Spheres of influence, for exam example, describes the global environment during the Cold War. Um, at its simplest, the United States and its allies in Europe and Asia built a sphere of political and economic freedom, while the Soviet Union, by contrast, maintained a sphere of political repression and co a communist economic system throughout Eastern and Central Europe. They competed with each other for allies and partners all over the world, which led to clashes, conflicts, and proxy wars, um, at which many of which were referred to before. Mercantilism describes the main economic system in the 1600s and 1700s, which is basically the opposite of free trade, when, that involves extensive government regulation and high tariffs to limit imports. Not only did this limit economic growth, but the competition it created led to many, many decades of conflicts and war. And as I said earlier, if the United States does not intervene to protect the liberal and open rules-based architecture, including the freedom of the seas, there's no other country that has the capability to do so. Again, there are many ways to do this, and I'm certainly not arguing that the military tool is the only way to do this. You can do things including trade agreements and promoting norms of uh, global norms of transparency and cooperation, which I also think are vital things that the United States should be doing. It particularly requires active political and diplomatic leadership to protect the global commons. And uh, we can have a debate about whether uh, the cyber realm fits within that, but I think it does have a lot of attributes uh, of a, a public good that needs to be protected. But both of these also do require a strong military that can deter threats, and again, if deterrence fails, to counter those threats effectively. So that's my argument about why the U.S. should remain a superpower. Now I want to go after the word soul in the resolution, because I think that one's a, a little tricky, too. In some ways, the United States doesn't have a choice. In the short to medium term, there simply are no other countries that are going to be superpowers or, or could potentially emerge as a global rival to the United States. And I see that period lasting for at least five to ten years from where we are today. So the word should in there to me is a much longer term issue because for the, for the short to medium term, there's really not a whole lot of competition uh, for that position. But I want to argue that the United States should remain a superpower even in the longer period of time um, because the U.S. is the guarantor of that open and liberal order and any challenger who might rise to superpower status would most likely try to undo that order. In that time frame, the only countries that could fundamentally challenge the positions would establish a world that would gravely harm U.S. national interests and U.S. values as well. For the moment, there really is only one country that has, seems to have the potential to do that. Russia is often mentioned as a possible contender. It certainly used to have a lot of power, but it's actually a very weak state in terms of governance, demographics, and even in its military power. It does a very good job of masking that through its tremendous natural resources and through some skillful diplomacy, but in many ways it is still a very weak state. India also sometimes comes to mind as a state that could be a, a global superpower. Um, it's not a strong military power. A lot of that is by choice, but I don't see any trends that are changing that in the years to come even though I think its economic power will continue growing. Uh, 
And Brazil is an example of a country that is often mentioned, um, which is investing more in military power um, and may well become a strong regional power, but I don't see it rising to the level again in the time frame that I'm talking about to take on a truly global role. That leaves one country that has the potential to rise to be a superpower competitor to the United States, and that is China. I want to be very clear here that I am not saying that China will be a superpower competitor to the United States. I don't want it, that to be interpreted as I see China as the next big threat along the lines of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. China's power is growing, and it could grow peacefully. The economic links between China and the United States could promote a cooperative relationship or at least prevent economic competition from spilling over into military competition. But there are some very concerning signs about China's trajectory right now, and I think that that is something that the United States needs to hedge against, not because it's a foreseen conclusion, but because the United States needs to be doing a bunch of things now to prepare for the fact that it might go down that path in the future. I mentioned before that the freedom of the seas is being increasingly challenged, and the best example of that is in the South China Sea, where there are daily incidents involving uh, boats from Southeast Asian countries, um, as well as Japan and Korea, um, from China's uh, not just naval forces, but also their commercial shipping fleets, going after boats that are transiting the area and basically violating international law by, by asserting a different type of Chinese claim that is not recognized by the United Nations. On the military side, China is also developing what military analysts like me called anti-access area denial capabilities. And what those mean uh, is they basically prevent another country uh, from coming be from being able to transit international waters near China or near whatever country is building them. Again, China's not the only country building these capabilities. But you take these two trends together, and I see a very problematic future, the potential for a very problematic future arising. We must hedge against the possibility that China will develop both the ability and the intent to interfere with the freedom of seas off its shores in violation of recognized international law. One way to hedge, for example, and some of my previous writing has focused on this, the US military should be investing today in building the airplanes and ships that it might need 10 years out to counter that possibility. Because airplanes and ships take about a decade to build. So if you want to make sure you have the capability to respond, if China does go down that direction, those are the things you need to be buying today. Because if you wait till 10 years, years from now, it will be too late. Let me just briefly conclude by emphasizing that the United States does not have to dictate policies to others to intervene extensively around the world or focus solely on military power in order to remain a superpower as I've defined it. And in fact, I'm actually quite concerned about the growing weakness of some of our partners, particularly in Europe. Um, I think the United States would be far better off, actually, if Europe could become a stronger global actor. And the US has very strong interest in promoting that uh, happening. But I do think, as I said before, that the United States directly benefits from the global system as it's now set up. And more important than that, most other states in the international system benefit from that too, at least compared to what the alternative is. And so the United States continuing to, pr to protect that role and continuing to play that role in the world not only promotes US interests, but it also promotes US values. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, both of you. That uh, gives us a, so much to chew on. I've, I've got so many, and I'll try to turn it loose after a few. But um, uh, first of all, I, I'll, let me look to you, Nora. To, uh, Tom made a, a strong assertion and an interesting one that uh, this is the first moment that all of the great powers as major interests coincide. Um, I want to get your take on that assertion and also the policy implications of this unique period and what that does uh, to your sole superpower as you defined it. Um, I don't actually think we're in a period where the interests are quite as, um, coincide quite as much as I think Tom does. Um, I certainly, on um, many of the things that, that Tom mentioned, including uh, population shifts, climate change, and all of those things, I do think that there are common interests there. But I think that there are very strong, certainly e different economic interests. Uh, there's still a tremendous amount of global economic competition. I think the competition for resources is going to get even tighter. I don't just necessarily mean in the oil markets. There are some interesting developments in, uh, in the, with fracking and, and shale oil development that may uh, make that less of a concern in the short term. 
Um, but I do fundamentally think that there are a lot of countries whose interests may conflict. I'm not going to say that they do right now. I see where the world is today at a very, very interesting moment in time. I think we really are at a strategic inflection point that doesn't come around very often. Um, the most recent ones have been after World War II and after the Cold War, you could argue whether 9-11 was one or not, where the international system is fundamentally changing. The United States is, is withdrawing from, from 12 years of bloody wars, reassessing its role in the world and its relations, and I think a lot of other countries are doing the same things too. I think we'll know a lot more in about two years from now just the extent to which those interests are aligned or aren't, but I see a lot of fundamental issues that countries will continue to compete over as they always have. Thank you. What does that do to your assertion? Anything, any caveats you need to put into yours, or are you still comfortable with that? Anyone who says, <laughs> anyone who says that they have enormous confidence in their, their 10 to 20 year projections about the international system and about what actions now will be optimal for the evolution of foreign policy is either a fool or a liar. <laughs> we, there, we are in the realm of great uncertainties. I mean, it's even in the, in the realm of domestic policy, it's often very hard to know what inputs are going to produce what outputs in 10 years. We don't know whether Obamacare will, will make health care more expensive or actually will ultimately reduce expenses, despite the efforts of some of our best minds to figure it out. Just, and that's in the domestic sphere. I think it's, it's more problematic in the international sphere. Uh, and the, the points that you raised, Nora, uh, about competition particularly for resources, uh, and you might have added water, which I think uh, is one of the most likely sources of conflict, not just among great powers, but among, among lesser states in the future, is one that concerns me particularly. And I, I just read the other day that the average Chinese person has only about 40% of the water which UN agencies say is necessary for a minimally decent existence. Uh, so they don't have, just have resource issues, they have water issues. And the effort of China to address them is going to increase tensions with, with India. Uh, nevertheless, when I see the, inter, the economic interdependence, which Nora pointed out, uh, it is the first interest of every regime is self-perpetuation. When we talk about national, we should really talk about two sets of interests. There's the interest of, of regimes in surviving and continuing, and, not, and, and a regime is just more than the people in power, but the, the elite of each society wants to retain its position. And the present, the present system, it seems to me, see, I, I agree with Nora that the present system works for not only the 60 countries that cooperate rather closely, but for lots of other countries, including the Chinese. What is the source of legitimacy for the Chinese government now that ideology is dead? I've yet to, to meet someone who believes in Marxism in China. I spent quite a bit of time in China over the past 15 years. They only have two things. Maybe they cut in two ways, because one is nationalism. And there, there are psychological conflicts of interest, you might say, psychic conflicts of interest, as well as, well as material conflicts of interest, if that makes any sense. Um, the other, of course, is growth, is delivering the economic goods. That's the, those are the only two things that the regime, once ideology goes, those are the only two things left for the legitimacy of the system. And I, I think the... The dis a disruption in the international economic system, which would result from increasingly intense competition between us and the Chinese, would be, would be threatening to one of the two pillars of the regime. If it happened, however, that would leave the nationalist pillar, and then I would become very worried. Yes. Thank you. Let me, let me get back to you. They, we, we say hindsight is 2020. I'm not so sure that's true in this area, but you'd, 
you nicely walked us through kind of our recent history. U.S. is a as a, a dual superpower, at least in in, uh, in in reputation, if not in reality, up until the fall of the USSR. Um, a rich debate until 9/11, and then a new phase. How uh, very quickly? How has the U.S. had the right approach um, through these periods? Can you kind of say, tell us? Whether the U.S. had it right against USSR, they had it right before 9-11, and are, are they getting it wrong now? How, how can we talk about that? I've, I've begun thinking about a book on the, the, dissent, the dissenters at each of the critical phases in U.S. foreign policy since 1945. And so the, this question kind of fits with this still a somewhat inchoate idea, which I, I hope will sometime materialize. Uh, I, I think that the policy of containment, let's say there were two views of containment that eventually emerged. One was the Kennan view of containment, and one was the Nitsa view of containment, and Nitsa won. Because Kennan believed we need to contain them militarily in, and politically in Europe. But then in, in the rest of the world, the emphasis would be on, on soft, soft power. And that eventually, the dysfunction of the Soviet system, and, and in this he was incredibly farsighted, the dysfunction of the Soviet system would ultimately bring down the system. It wasn't Ronald Reagan. It was the, in, the intrinsic dysfunction and breakdown of morale, but that's part of the dysfunction. Did Reagan of hasten the it, though? We just took a little bit of Reagan's gloss off. Did he deserve I something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, he would have been a nice guy to have a beer with. I have no doubt about 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 that. Uh, Wait, so I, but I if Jimmy, if, it's J possible. Okay. if it's Jimmy Carter would have won his second term, would would the Soviet Union have fallen in in 1989? In your opinion, would we have had a similar timeline? I don't know about the about the same timeline, okay. uh, and that's I just think that's too hard to right. to predict. But I'm, if if you want to give give the Gipper uh, <laughs> some credit. <laughs> Let's give it to him. I mean, he's, he's dead, so it doesn't make sense. As far as, far as we know, his, his wife always <laughs> drew a veil over his presence. Uh, the point I was, I was going to make is that, in fact, we conducted a global Cold War to cite the, the title or to use the title of a, of a very great history book called The Global Cold War, which is really about the global, the Cold War in the global south, in Latin America, in, in Asia, and so on. And I think we made, we made great mistakes, if, and you know, this goes back all the way back to, to Vietnam, to Central America. Those were all mistakes, I think. But the, the basic strategy of containing them in Europe, I agreed with. And then for the other areas, it would depend on, on the circumstances, but we didn't let it depend on the circumstances, except paradoxically in Europe, where Yugoslavia, a communist country, we absorbed into the free world, as it were. Yeah. And yet we could have done the same thing with Vietnam, treated it as an Asian Yugoslavia. But because of this framing, communists, bad people, so instead of Instead of making a real politique uh, cost-benefit analysis, we made a mistake. So as far as that period goes, I say yes for what we did in Europe, very good, totally endorsed it. Uh, not so good for what we did in the Global South during that period. So that, that's that period. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll just, just, just the other period we're going to talk about is the struggle against terrorism since 9-11. Since Here's sort of my take on that. Well, we, and it's not over. We've got to be quick. So between, so I'll just, okay. say, can you give me a, a grade on U.S. foreign policy from the fall of the Soviet Union until 9-11? I would, I would give it, if, if it's A to F, in graduate school sometimes they only give anything we'll lower than F. B. A to F, no grade inflation. I've heard about the school. So if it's A to F, I'm going to give it a, a C plus, because I think there was an opportunity for new institution building, 
as occurred after the Second World War, when, as Nora pointed out, we created the world, a new world order. We did what Bush was talking about at that period. We did it after World War II. I don't think we were institutionally creative and didn't think in those terms during, the second, during this phase before 9-11. All right, now I've got to ask this too. So, um, so pre, uh, during the, uh, the Cold War, what do you give us overall? You gave us your breakdown. Overall, what was A for it? Europe and C for C minus for Global South. A and C minus. All right, we're going to come back to you for this. Now, give me your grade, and if you need a little analysis on terrorism uh, post 9 11, what do we get there? C minus. C minus. A little grade inflation there, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, all right. But now we're at the point where we're going to start looking ahead to a different. Potentially different. Okay. Quickly, give me those, give me your three grades, and if you need to explain it, tell me. So, as a, uh, during the Cold War, where are we? Uh, I actually pretty much agree. I think A for Europe, a lesser grade elsewhere. Maybe I'd be, uh, you're going to, you know, reveal how we grade our students, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hope they're not listening. Okay, but, but yeah. fairly comparable, maybe a little, yeah, a little kinder on the rest of the yep. world, but, but not much. Okay, and so then you get to uh, uh, that, that short period between the fall and 9-11. How do we do there? I'd give that a B plus. I, do, I agree that there's probably more we could have done to institutionalize things, but I think that uh, m overall, we were actually very smart in how we managed the collapse of the Soviet Union Agreed. because that could have been a, an absolute disaster, and it wasn't. We don't get enough credit for avoiding disasters in U.S. foreign policy. Um, and I think a lot of the peacekeeping operations that were held in the 1990s were tremendously beneficial. Great. And now, uh, post 9-11, how have we done up till now? Well, here I want to make a distinction because Perfect. if you ask me about the war on terrorism, as in are we, have we done things to make the homeland safer, um, I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. If you ask me about the conduct of U.S. foreign policy overall since 9-11, I'd give us a D, even though I'd probably give the, you know, the actual part of it that is countering direct terrorist threats to the United States an A. Hmm. The, it, 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 well. An A with footnotes, because there are certainly civil liberties concerns that you'd have to weigh in there. This is important. That's, that's fair. But um, you know, in terms of you know, doing the things we need to do to make sure we're not getting attacked again, I think we've done quite well. The, the, uh, my, my personal view is that U.S. foreign policy since 9-11 has actually been a tragedy, because the U.S. had tremendous international sympathy for what it was doing in the post-9-11 post world. Uh, the war in Afghanistan, I think, was a necessary one, and, but the way that it was fought, uh, even early on, uh, laid the seeds for some of the problems that came after in that operation. Um, and I think that Iraq was, will go down as one of the greatest strategic blunders that the United States has ever made, full stop. This was not a country that, I mean, it, it, and not only, we, it, this is a country that was not involved in the threat that attacked us on September 11th. Um, this was known by many at the time, uh, despite the public debates. It was very clear to analysts early on. Um, it squandered all of the goodwill that the United States had and could have done something tremendous with, drained U.S. Uh, both uh, blood and treasure, and left us strategically worse off as an outcome, period. Thank but you. I don't have strong views. <laughs> All right, I vowed to, to get it back to you by 7.05, so I've got to get rid of my long questions for a second so I can live up to that. Um, you talked about we need more planes and ships, and it made me think briefly about the foreign policy debate between Obama and Romney, where Obama scored a nice little cheap shot there. Um, <laughs> But uh, can, can I just brag for a second? <laughs> that cheap shot that on the four percent of defense spending was a, a research associate at the Center for a New American Security who did that, published a paper, got picked up at the campaign. He is the only first-year master's student, I think, in the history of the world who has had his work picked up and mentioned twice in a presidential debate. Nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, is the U.S. defense budget too big or too small or just right, knowing? what you said we have to do to, to essentially fulfill your, your definition of a superpower. I'm glad you added that last part because something that drives me nuts about the debate about the defense budget is you cannot answer that question unless you first say what you want the Defense Department to do. There is no such thing as too much or too little in a vacuum, right? It needs to be tied to what the strategic ends are. 
Um, my view is that the current defense cuts, the way they are allocated, that's the key phrase, the way that they are allocated will be a disaster for the Defense Department. But the reason why I emphasize the way that they're allocated is because for a variety of reasons, which I will keep very short, and you know, now I can drop my hint about things if you're interested in later, um, about half of the defense budget has been, in, has been entirely taken off the table for the cuts. So things like military pay, uh, retirement benefits, and so on, and, and including some extra bases, take up about, I mean, I'm between 45 and 50 percent of the DOD budget, and there will be no cuts to those things at all due to a set of political choices largely by Congress. So the cuts that are then coming to the pointy end of the spear uh, are actually really quite deep and devastating. And in the paper that you mentioned, we called it the seven deadly sins of defense reform because we wanted to get attention. We argue that if you made some of these changes on the personnel side and on the business practices of DOD, you could actually save more than enough money to comp compensate for the cuts that are being made under sequestration, maintain the same level of defense spending and keep the same amount of military capability. So you don't have to spend more, but you really do have to fundamentally change how you spend the dollars you have. All right, thank you. Do you want to comment on defense budget in any, in any way before we turn it loose? Only in one respect. We, we always talk about, well, in the last 20 years, not always, hard power and soft power. But it's, it's very rare that anyone tries to operationalize the idea of soft power. That is, what does it mean? other than being a nice country. Uh, we don't spend much money on soft power. We spend very little money on soft power. And it's an open question, but it's at least a question of whether if we had a national security budget, not just a defense budget, but a national, so that the State Department, all the elements of foreign policy constituted a single budget, <laughs> then we would think, we'd have to think more about what we wanted to do with that budget, more about soft power. And let me give you an example of what soft power might be, which might have contributed more to the war against terrorism, which is ultimately, and I think we can see this, we can see that Al-Qaeda has metastasized, that there are little Al-Qaeda's, and there are probably going to be more Al-Qaeda's scattered around the world, including inside the United States. They may be very small, but the capacity of very small groups to do a great deal of damage is obviously growing all the time and should be a source and is a source of acute concern. Suppose, let's say the Iraq war to this point has cost a trillion dollars. It's an order of magnitude. It could be a couple of hundred billion one way or the other, more likely the other. <laughs> and suppose we had spent 10% of that, 100 billion to endow schools, madrasas, for poor children in Pakistan and other Islamic countries, which we created a, a trust, and that the trustees were Islamic intellectuals, and there are plenty of them, who really want to restore intellectual richness to the Islamic world. And then they would select teachers from all over the world who, don't, who aren't Wahhabis in their orientation. And we'd, be, we'd begin to produce in these schools, they wouldn't be our schools anymore, we just have endowed them. We, we produce a, a great many people, a new generation of, of people with a different mindset. I'm not sure, but at least it's not, to me, totally implausible that this would have a significant impact. Now, it's not a significant impact if you're talking 500 million or a billion or two billion, it's really, spending a lot of money. And if, you're, if you really think soft power can work, then you may want to move some of your hard power assets into soft power. But you can only think that through if you had a single budget. We don't have anything like that now. We, we violently agree on that part, on that point. <laughs> I, I love violent agreement. <laughs> well, great. Well, with that, let me turn it to the audience and we'll We'll take questions. Is there a, oh, and Wayne's got the microphone, so wait till Wayne gets to you, and if you would, would state your name and anything else of interest, and then a, a short, concise question. Uh, Forrest Dupre. Uh, my question is, at a time when Japan is reevaluating its defense posture, uh, Saudi Arabia is uh, 
declining a seat on the Security Council and saying that the U.S. can't be trusted, and uh, countries like Brazil are increasing their defense budget. If we're not the sole superpower, does that um, increase the desire of countries uh, or does it lead to a possible increase in nuclear proliferation among countries that feel they need to do it themselves because we, are, we will not be there to do that for them? Who wants first crack on that one? Well, I'll, I'll take a crack. I know Nora wants to get into this too, and I'd like to hear what Nora has to say. Uh, I, I, I've been thinking about this, this issue with, with, without coming to an entirely, for me, satisfactory conclusion. I think one of the ways to re reduce, to compete with the jihadi narrative, and that's maybe our central problem in dealing with the terrorism threat long term. There's a jihadi narrative which attracts people, and we need a counter-narrative. And one of the ways of achieving that counter-narrative is to reduce and ultimately eliminate the high militarized profile that we have in the Middle East. So that makes me think, you know, not, no base, get the, get, the, get the base out of Bahrain. Remove ourselves from the Middle East as quickly as, not tomorrow, but as quickly as possible. That would be part of building the counter, strengthening the counter narrative. But then I think, hmm, could that be done without a, the development of a modus vivendi among the major states in the Middle East, particularly Iran and Saudi Arabia? Because if it, without that, with, if you have the present state of relationships among the actors in the Middle East, then won't, won't the Saudis want to go nuclear? And maybe other states as well. So if, I'm worried about the proliferation issue too, and not only there, also in, in Asia. Nora points out we have this vast network of security agreements. And as Andrew Basovich likes to point out, and Chalmers Johnson, we have about 700 installations scattered around the world. And we rotate 400,000 troops around the world because we have all of those. And what is that in the long term in our interest, or is it likely to lead in the long term to a situation where we'll either have to fight, even to region, even non-nuclearly, or we will ha then have to pull back under the worst possible circumstances. We'll probably fight, because that's going to serve the national interest. I don't know. That transition is extremely difficult. But it all, it all goes the same. It, it's not only about nuclear proliferation, but I agree with you with what you're implying, that that's a central part of the problem about Yes, I, I agree. Nora. Let me take a position which is a little bit controversial, but I think is worth exploring. One of the reasons why Japan is re-examining its security posture is because it is concerned about rising power in China and is increasingly concerned about the credibility of U.S. commitments to protecting Japan. They're a long way from making a decision to get
question on your debate about the Gipper and Jimmy Carter. <laughs> there's, there's one thing that we've overlooked in the discussion, one of the most important figures in the change, because if Leonid Brezhnev had stayed in power, I'm not so sure when the wall would have come down. We must not overlook that perhaps the most influential person was Mikhail Gorbachev. And I think sometimes we as Americans put so much emphasis on our own viewpoint, we overlook the tremendous impact that he had in reversing the Brezhnev doctrine among his own people. So I think we, we have to keep that in mind. But my question, I think, as we're considering this debate, Eisenhower, when he left the presidency, warned the country of the military-industrial complex. And we have a tremendous, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, our defense budget is probably equal to the next 10 countries put together. Something of, of that nature. And so I think we give a little short shrift. And to maintain our superpower, we have to maintain our domestic stability and our own economy. And so how do you balance the defense budget? How do we get to the goals? What are we doing in this defense budget? The cost overruns, all the problems we have, and all the money that's being spent, how much are we being dictated by what Eisenhower warned us about, about the influence of the military-industrial complex and all the money that's tied up in there, and how do we balance that off with domestic programs if we weaken ourselves on the interior? because our defense budget is so big and out of line for maintaining even our superpower status. And secondly, how do we deal with the moral problem of a superpower that we've dealt with for the last 10 years, having the best military, a professional military, but ruining so many soldiers because we have not had a draft. We rely on one to 2% of our population to carry the military action. We deploy people three and four and five times because we will not involve the rest of the country, how do we maintain our moral fiber with our superpower status if we continue to rely on one or two percent of our population's investor and it becomes too easy to take military action because it's someone else's son or daughter who's doing the fighting and it's not involving most of the country. Thank you, Nora. Why don't you? tackle the parts that you feel inclined to hit. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm, I'm not going to address your second point because I agree with it. I think that, you know, it, it, the fact that such a small number of people have been involved in fighting and, and in these nations' wars is a huge civil military issue that affects all of society. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. I think it's incredibly important. If that's true, do we need a draft or do we need mandatory service? Um, I, I don't think that there's a need for a draft. I don't think that's the right solution um, for a whole variety of reasons that have to do with skill sets and the numbers of people and all that. But I do think it's far more important for military and civilian communities to talk to each other, to understand each other. They're very polarized. Military people end up living on bases and in a bubble. They don't interact with civilians, and very few civilians know anybody who serves in the military. I think that conversation needs to happen very fundamentally. Um, but let me, let me quickly tackle your, your question about the defense budget. Um, I don't think that the cost overruns and all the problems, there are certainly huge problems. And again, I wrote a, co-authored a report on this, so I, I'm very well aware of the issues that you raise. Um, I don't give blame solely, at least, to the military industrial complex. For example, one of the reasons why there are tremendous cost overruns is that the, these, that the government changes its requirements midstream, um, which is part of what increases the costs. Um, and we can go into more examples, but it's, it's, it's more complicated than that, even though I completely agree that a lot of the business pra practices in DOD are broken. Um, I also strongly agree that the US needs to be strong at home in order to be s strong ab abroad. Um, I actually don't see the defense budget as that big a part of the fiscal problems that the United States is having. Um, the big issue is entitlements um, and health care. And again, wherever you come down on that, you just look at the numbers of what the US budget is based on, and that is going to be consuming an ever greater percentage of the US, uh, of U the US economy. If we don't fix those problems, we can't, we can't solve those problems. We can't solve the fiscal problems by cutting the defense budget. Even if you zeroed it out tomorrow, it would have very little impact on the overall economic health of the United States. 
So I do think that you know, investing in a military that is capable of doing the things that I talked about in terms of protecting the global commons is very important. I don't think comparing what we spend to the next 10 countries is necessarily that instructive because what you spend is an input value. What I care about is the output, which is the capabilities, and most countries get far fewer capabilities for their dollars than, than we do in a certain sense, um, at least among our allies and partners that come the next down. Those trends are changing. Uh, and I do believe that the U.S. needs to remain a global power, as I mentioned before. Um, so I do think that some level of defense spending is necessary. I don't think it's exclusive with the spending on the soft power that I totally agree. I think we need to be spending more on maintaining the U.S. role in the world um, while we solve our fiscal problems at home. And I don't think that those two are necessarily incompatible. Anything in the question or response you want to address? It, it's, it's related, I think. that. The, the neoconservatives argue that during the Cold War, we spent a larger percentage of our GNP on the defense budget. And nevertheless, the country was, in general, thrived during the post-World War II period. It was a period of great prosperity in the United States. And that we're spending less now, and therefore we could spend more and there's no reason why we couldn't continue to be prosperous. Uh, Nora, I think you are making the point that, well, conditions have changed and that the financial strains are different and the structure of the economy is, is changing. It's not what it was 40 years ago. And that this is putting m more strain on all aspects of of, of the production of public goods, including defense, defense goods. Part of it may have to do with the increased comp the competitiveness of the international system. After all, in 1960, when Jack Kennedy was elected president, the three most powerful automobile companies in the world were still in Detroit. Uh, and then we've been drawing down our infrastructure. We've been drawing down our capital for a long time and some replacement is needed. So there are a lot of financial strains, a lot of needs now which, didn't, which are different than the needs at the height of the Cold War. And, and this, this is presenting us with dilemmas which neither Nora nor I, I think, can satisfactorily resolve. I don't know where, where it's, it's leading. And it also, of course, part of the dilemma is the, obviously the growing inequality in the distribution of income and well, money, money and power. It's not so much the military industrial complex I would be worrying about. I would be worrying about the enormous concentration of capital in very small hands, which translates into political power. That, to me, is a much more serious problem than the mili so-called military industrial complex. And any event, it's Part of it is, is not the military industrial complex, but the, these small towns and cities all over the country whose economy is dependent upon their bases. And that's not the military industrial complex. That's the congressman in the gerrymander district who represents the people in that base town like Colorado Springs. Thank you. We actually only have time for one more question. I called on both of you, so I'm going to ask you to say even or odd. If you get it right, you get the final question. <laughs> I've got the finger beneath my thing, the table. It's odd, so you get our last question. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Very, clever. Very clever. Hi, my name's Sarah Wagner. Um, if the U.S. did withdraw its presence just enough from the global community, to not be considered a superpower, then what, what would you propose that the U.S.'s role would be internationally then? Well, well as, you could, as you could tell, Nora and I aren't all that far apart. Um, I was emphasized, I was really, first of all, I was to some degree arguing with someone who wasn't here. <laughs> but it's more than one person. It's, it's, a, it's a whole group of people in the country, not all in Washington, but they're, they're propagandists, or publicists is a more polite word, are, are 
are centered in Washington. Uh, so the argument is more intensely with them. And so I remember my, my interpretation, it's, and remember it's Seoul's superpower. I didn't say we shouldn't be a superpower. I wasn't suggesting we become Sweden. <laughs> now I like the Swedes. I've had some wonderful times in Sweden, but we can't do it, even if we wanted to. Uh, we're going to be a superpower. I was emphasizing the sole superpower, and then translating that into a certain set of attitudes, which it seems to me tended to go with the commitment to be the sole superpower. And the most important one, I, I, I think, well, the two are most important ones, uh, this view of the world as organized into not countries with conflicting interests, but evil countries and good countries. That was, that was one dimension of it. And the other is to emphasize the, f the fact that we are, we being exceptional and critical to world order, we must stand outside the system of order and be able to act in, in a way inconsistent with that order, with the rules, when necessary. Those are the two, the two problems I, I see instinct in the desire to be the sole superpower. I do agree with Nora that for the next five to 10 years, there is no alternative, but obviously the Chinese are increasing their resources, but they may be more unstable than they appear to be at the moment. They have other problems, like breathing. <laughs> <laughs> If you've, been to, if you've been to Beijing recently. <laughs> Nor a final word. Yeah, I'd, I'd just quickly say that, that the, you know, the logical alternatives to the US being a superpower are either becoming a regional power, where you, know, you go back to sort of what US foreign policy was focused on probably in the second half of the, uh, of the uh, 1800s, where you care a lot about what's going on in, in the Western Hemisphere and not much beyond that, maybe with Europe uh, as well. Um, and the alternative to that, the, the, the other alternative, which I think you're getting a lot of, you're hearing a lot about today and why I think that this debate and this topic is so important, is really a, a more isolationist view that takes this view of we need to be strong at home and goes one step further and says, you know, that the United States really needs to turn inward to focus on its problems, to not worry about the rest of the world in an effort to solve its own problems. Um, and that view, I think, is very, is very dangerous and is gaining a lot of ground. I think it's dangerous because these two things do not need to be opposed to one another. Um, I think you know, everybody agrees we have a lot of problems. You know, I live in Washington, I look at Capitol Hill, I, we have a lot of problems. <laughs> um, but the, the, the fallacy that we have in many ways the option of turning inward and focusing solely on ourselves and ignoring the fact that we do have interests that extend across the world and that we benefit from them, um, I think is a very dangerous trend in the public debate. Thank you. Let's give our panelists a big hand. Thanks for a great job. Thank you. Uh, our, our closing statement, uh, our closing statement will be by Amos Giora. Amos? So, first of all, I want to thank the three of you for absolutely an extraordinary evening. When Wayne and I thought about what would be the issues that would be most relevant in this most complicated time, I think that we actually, you know, hit a bullseye. And there's no doubt that your comments, your candor, and your insights enriched us enormously. So on behalf of the law school and the Center for Global Justice, I truly want to thank all the three of you. I think this really was an extraordinary conversation. I think that from the perspective of the uh, Jefferson Fordham debate, um, tradition that Dean Adler mentioned. I think this was right in line with that. And again, thank you so much to the three of you. And thank, thank you, you to all, all of you for your questions. Thank, thank you. you. That was fun. That was fun. Thank you very much.